John chapter 9. Begin by reading the whole chapter, John chapter 9. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and, and uh, with that, uh, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind, said, Is this not he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? That he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight, until the, they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already, that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. They said, Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him, and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins. Dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, 
And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore, your sin remaineth. Now, this is an interesting tale. I just love the back and forth here and how they're constantly just grilling this man. I, I'm thinking that once, you know, if you're blind your whole life and suddenly you were made to see, that you might just want to go and, and experience a few things. Um, that hymn that we sang, All the world seemed to sing of a Savior and King when peace finally entered into my heart. He's talking about how... Even though the world hates God, that day that you were saved, didn't it seem like the whole world was just kind of singing of his blessedness? That, that great weight comes off of your shoulders. I think for that often, I remember it was like scales had come from my eyes, that even the trees looked more beautiful, and even the bird songs sound more lovely. And, and I really did feel light that day. I felt like there was a great burden lifted from me. And so here is a man that... For the first time ever, those trees that I saw with new eyes, he saw for the first time ever. Now, we find out later that this man wasn't saved through the course of this discussion. But that's the point of interest that I want to grab a hold of, is that all of this revelation comes from a man that was an unbeliever until the end of the chapter. And so, even as it is for us, we are saved and we see. He was made to see that was once blind. And I bet you he wanted to enjoy that time. I bet you he wanted to kind of rejoice in what he was seeing. And instead he was brought through this barrage of people trying to question him about the man who had made him to see. And it's just interesting to watch the, the, the unfolding of this conversation, how he repeats himself time and time and, and time again. And then finally asks, you know, that kind of uh, pointed question. Well, are you going to ask me to tell you it again? Are you going to be his disciple? Are you going to follow after him? To the religious leaders, I love that, how he gives them a little bit of uh, a little bit of sass at this time. Now go to Luke, keep your finger in John chapter 9. Go to Luke chapter 12 and verse 11. So again, we're looking at the fact that this revelation came from somebody that was completely unlearned in the scriptures, completely an unbeliever, and yet he kind of grows into this thing as, as, uh, as the, it goes along. Luke chapter 12 and in verse 11 it says, And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. And so, by revelation here of the last days, prophesying that's going to come from believers, I believe it's going to be by and large from people that have not prepared for what to say. They have not written out a three-point sermon. They haven't made it alliteration. They haven't, they haven't toned it and, and given it just the proper flow and, and, and wrote out verses that they'll read out as they, as they turn the, have the people turn the page to another verse. And, and they, they just have not prepared. But God here or gives us order that we're not even to prepare anyways. Because in that same hour, the Holy Ghost shall teach you what you ought to say. When you're brought before magistrates, when you're brought into the synagogues or the religious um, buildings, right? When you're brought to powers, don't take thought of the things you ought to say. Now back in John chapter 9, this was easy for this guy because he, he had no idea of what to say. He was just made to see. And so there was no preparation made. And I think we can, we can take from this an example of how it may be for us as we're brought before neighbors. We're brought before parents. We're brought before Pharisees. We're brought before kings and magistrates and the religious rulers to explain ourselves and to give our testimony. I believe in the last days, our big part of our testimony 
will not be in the highways and hedges. In fact, I believe that many of us are going to be, as the Bible promises there in Luke 12 and in other places, that we will be brought before great religious leaders. We will be brought before magistrates. We will be brought before powers to give a testimony, to give account of ourselves. We ought to not think much of these things because God, through His Holy Ghost, is going to give us power. Even as we're about to see, this man had been given power in Revelation as the course of events played out. In those last days, in these last days, the truth will always prevail. The truth will be sourced from the Holy Scriptures, not from YouTube conspiracies. And I get caught up into this too, where sometimes I'm going to talk about how I think the government's doing things and how I think that, that the different religious leaders are aligning things and how the Antichrist is going to come in. With, and I have a way of taking what I see on Fox News or in some uh, documentary and I apply it as if I have an understanding of these things. That, that's not going to be the source of truth. YouTube is not going to be the source of truth. The truth is going to come from the scriptures. And that what is ultimately what we need. A lot of people now are just posting YouTube and posting YouTube and posting YouTube and posting YouTube. And the ones that are watching most of this stuff, I find they're the ones that are exhibiting the most paranoid tendencies. If you're grounded in the scriptures, and I believe that the scriptures are there for this purpose, they're the only thing you need to understand what is going on in the last days. You don't need... Fox News. You don't need somebody to break down different news articles. Go to the scriptures. That's where you'll find the truth. And that's where the truth will prevail in these last days is if we pull it from the scriptures and use it with that purpose. Now verse 1 says in Reve or John chapter 9, it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man that was blind from his birth. And so his problem here is clear. He was blind from his birth. Now, oh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 12. I meant to read another passage in Luke chapter 12. We shouldn't let our fear then guide us and, and lead us. Luke chapter 12, and in verse 2 it says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you of whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. We need to take our fears and direct it at God. He has the ultimate power. He has the ultimate sway and influence over these leaders. But I see again an example of the opportunity that believers are going to have in the last day to take what God has spoken to them in darkness and proclaim it from the housetops. I believe that there's going to be very, very, very big proclamations of God's truth happening. God's truth will not be proclaimed in these last days with a few gathering in a little room. God's not, truth is not going to be primarily proclaimed with two by two by two going door to door to door. God is going to give us all very, very big platforms. He will talk to you, I believe, in secret and in darkness, and He intends that that would be heard in the light. He intends that those things that he tells us from his word would be proclaimed upon the housetop. He intends that God's people would be brought before magistrates, brought before great leaders, brought before the, the by and large kings of this earth in order that there would be a testimony against them so that he can finally judge the earth in righteousness. God desires his word to go to the uttermost. And so that's, again, we're picking at it. We're working at it. We're trying to knock all the doors we have in this city. But ultimately, I believe God's going to give his people in the last days very big platforms where we can proclaim his word. Now, that might make some people a little bit fearful if we haven't prepared the message and we don't aren't the best public speakers and we're nervous about being in front of large crowds. But, hey, don't fear them which can kill the body. Don't fear men. Don't fear flesh. Fear God above all things and trust, like the word says, that the Holy Ghost is going to be the one speaking for you. And I am holding out for that day. 
when my God will take a Daniel who is standing in his cause, in the cause and will of God, he will take a Daniel and use his stance, however small and insignificant it means or seems to be on the grand scheme of things. I'm holding out that God will take a man that is willing to stand in the gap, willing to stand between the dead and the living, willing to make up the hedge, and he will use that man of God to make a Darius say, I make a decree that men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. I believe God's going to use a man that is willing to stand in the gap and make a firm stance for the Lord Almighty. I believe he's going to use people, individuals, to make a Nebuchadnezzar say, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven as he addresses the whole world. God's going to give us big platforms because he wants his word to get out there in a really big way. So that the whole world will be without excuse, even more so than they are now. So then we shouldn't fear, we shouldn't be afraid, we shouldn't be dismayed, we shouldn't be disappointed at the things that we're seeing come to fruition. Rather, I believe it's time for Christians who are full of faith to get excited. The works of God should be manifest in us. That was the purpose of the man being born blind. That was the purpose of his hard circumstance. That was the purpose of his whole life up to that time being one of difficulty and challenge and suffering and not being a part of society and being shunned. The whole purpose was that the works of God should be manifest in him. And I believe God's whole purpose for sending us through suffering and trials and tribulations and struggles and being shunned from society and being, 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 being pushed away and thrust out by men is that his works should be manifest in us. Now, if God can prophesy of the Savior by a false prophet like Balaam, if he can take unbelieving Caiaphas and say something like, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that the whole nation perish not, when Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation as an unbeliever. Certainly he can and will use you. He Certainly he can and can use anybody in this room or under the sound of my voice for greater works even than these. These weren't men of faith. These weren't believers. These weren't even men of God. And yet God used them to make great proclamations to the entire world. God used them to make great decrees through the entire world that all men should worship God. He used them to prophesy of the coming Messiah. And yet they were unbelievers. How much more can he use you? Now I am believing that as God took unbelieving Gamaliel... And said regarding the ministry of God, and regarding perhaps my personal ministry, and perhaps regarding each one of our personal ministries, Gamaliel, an unbeliever, made the statement that if God, if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. If an unbeliever is going to make a great statement like that, that finds its way into the scriptures and resonates with God's people so intensely... That if God be for it, no one can be against it. Otherwise, you're literally fighting against God. If God can use a man like Gamaliel to make a proclamation like that, under the influence of the Spirit of God, he can use you. Go back to John chapter 9. John chapter 9 and verse 1, as I read. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was, born, which was blind from his birth. And the disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the problem is clear. The man's blind. We see that. Many knew of it. Many had, had known him. First thing we do is we see that he was blind from his birth. We see the problem. We see the, we see the circumstance. And we all want to try to figure out the cause. This is what we always do, right? We, we see a situation. We're like, what's the cause for that. What's the reason for that, right? Is it sin? Is it his sin? Is it his parents' sin? Now here, in our scenario, we have a problem. We have this, this virus evidently wreaking havoc on the world. 
And all of us want to do the same thing. We want to decipher what's the cause of this thing. Is it sin? Is it God's wrath? Is it, is it uh, men just fabricating these things in, in, uh, you know, in, in labs or something? Now, I, I don't believe that men can create viruses. Viruses are life, and the only creator of life is God. Amen. Certainly in a weapons facility, they could, they could kind of manipulate the, the, the manifestation of it and how it, how it I don't, what's the term? It's not evolved, but, but based, mutates, how it mutates. They can kind of control that and make super viruses, whatever. But man can't create the things like they're saying they do. But regardless, what I'm trying to say is that we see the problem of COVID and we're like, okay, what's the cause for this thing? Even as they do, they saw a blind man and they said, hey, is it because he sinned that all these things came to pass? If you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Sometimes things aren't so easily deciphered. We can't just kind of get to the bottom of these things and say, well, this is the cause, this is the manner, this is the reason for these things. And, and God deals with that in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Look at verse 11, it says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. What God is saying here through Ecclesiastes, through Solomon's pen, is that things don't always transpire the way you'd expect them. Things in life don't always order the way we would predict them to be. But there's this thing called time. There's this thing called chance that evidently just happens to us all. And so I can go and prepare and, 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 and lift the most weights out of anybody and, and try to do the, the, the skills competition to, to be the strong man at this event, right? But time and chance could happen in that day. Something could hinder me from, from being successful over somebody that had less preparation. The battle's not to the strong. Bread's not to the wise. Riches aren't to men of understanding. And you don't get favor just by being skillful. Verse 12, it says, For men also knoweth not his time. As the fishes are taken in an evil net, and as the birds are caught in a snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, and it falleth suddenly on them. When it falleth suddenly upon them. So we can't always predict the outcome, nor can we plan to not fall into a trap, fall into an evil net, be taken away suddenly by situations and circumstances that come upon us. But this is what we always try to do, is we try to evidently take a scenario and apply purpose to it, when, hey, this whole virus thing, it could just be time and chance happening to us all. It's just another event in the, in the, in the times and, and seasons that we live in that just, just happened, okay? Complete happenstance. The government and those evil laboratory guys didn't create it. God isn't here just purposely pointing this thing out as, as, a, as a, a targeted um, shot from his wrath. No, maybe this is just happenstance. Maybe this is just a scenario that has, has come upon us. But I don't believe that everything is just so kind of willy-nilly. Like just, like, while I do believe that time and chance happen, I believe that God's ultimately in control of it, and his bottom line in all things is revealed in verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents. John 9, verse 3. So they're all debating about who sinned and caused the blindness. And Jesus says, has nothing to do with the blindness. We're all contemplating about who unleashed this deadly virus. And Jesus is like, this has nothing to do with your sin or your government. or your." Jesus says, but that the works of God may be made manifest in him. God's bottom line is that he wants... His works in this world to be manifested. He wants His will to come out on top. Is this a judgment of God that we see? Is this just dumb, blind luck that we see? We need to worry less for the cause and focus more on what the Lord is trying to do through it. What the Lord is trying to do through all of this is show forth His works to the sons of men. He is trying to get through to people. He's trying to get through to us. He's trying to show us a truth. Even as Jesus took this blind man, performed a miracle, 
after all the suffering and all the time that had passed, he had done it for the purpose that his works would be made manifest before all. The only purpose of the blind birth is that the works of God would be made manifest. Verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And here's, an, here's a good lesson for us. We're in the world today, aren't we? And Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And Jesus also said to us, ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it on a bushel, but on a candlestick. And they giveth light that are unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Jesus, to the blind man, exhibited his good works while being the light of the world. And his desire for his believers is that they would show the works of God while being a light to the world. He said, even as I am in the world, presently, I am the light of the world. Ye are the light of the world was the, was the, the command that was given to us afterwards. This is a lesson for us. We're leaving one day. We're going to be in this world no longer one day. But while we're here, we need to be the light of the world. Night is coming when no man can work. Okay? But we haven't experienced that yet. Not by a long shot. You know when night's coming when no Christian can work? When they've bound your hands. When they've cut your tongue out. When they've removed your head. God's works can still be manifest in a Christian that is hogtied but has a mouth to run. Right? Preach the word in season, out of season. Rebuke, reprove, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It's true that the night is coming when no man can work. That's why we need to be emphasizing the first part of verse 4 when it says, I must work the works of him that sent me. I must. I need to. I have to. I'm compelled to. I gotta do the works of the Father while it is yet day. That night is coming. That day is coming when no man can work. Whether we die and leave this world by natural cause, we die and leave this world by some virus that gets us, whether we die and leave this it doesn't even matter when we're raptured out of here. That'll be the night when we can't work anymore. That'll be the opportunity ceasing as far as our ministry in this world goes. But as long as we are in the world, we need to be the light of the world. As Christ was, we got to do the same. Now, Jesus' solution to the problem here, okay? And that's usually the kind of order of things. We find a problem. We try to figure out what was the cause of this thing. And then we're going to bring a solution. Look at Jesus' solution in verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, everything that happens there is completely in the physical realm, okay? We see it, and it's dirty, and it's messy, and it's uncomfortable. And you know what? We're in, going into days that are going to be dirty and messy and uncomfortable, okay? This thing is, this solution to the problem of being blind, it was unusual, it was unconventional, it was remarkable, even as much as the miracle that was about to take place was. Verse 7 it says, and he said unto him, so he did the act, spitting on the ground, making clay, rubbing it on his eyes, completely physical. And then the spiritual word comes out. And what does the word say? Go. Wash in the pool of Siloam, and I love that, which by interpretation sent, which is by interpretation sent. That needs to be a whole, a whole uh, sermon there. Sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. So the word of God came forth, and he obeyed the word of God, and he came seeing. So do you know what happened? A physical solution, but it wasn't activated until faith followed. The word of God came out. He, by faith, did what the word of God said and came seeing. He saw the solution uh, finalized as he came seeing. He went and he came seeing. Sent, the blind man, he was sent in his sorry state. He was born blind. He was born with that same problem. Sent, Christ sent to be the Savior of the world. And he said to him by the word of God, go and wash. And when he did, he came seeing. 
And we know the Bible records of itself that it's the washing of the water of the word that cleanses those that are ailing and, and cleans up our lives and cleans up our filthy souls and makes us whiter than snow. Do you know what we need to do? We need to go home and wash with the water of the word and then come see him. And that's our sending. Even as the promises were made that we would go and we would preach to great kings and great princes and great leaders, it started with a discussion in darkness, in a closet, behind closed doors. Wash with the water of the word by faith and then come see him. Now God does a great work here, but as it always is, the reaction is not what's expected. Of course, the blind man's rejoicing, he's excited. He probably just wanted to go for a stroll in the park and, and see things, see nature, see his surroundings, the things that he had heard before, what they look like, and enjoy that, that time, that new walk with uh, his new eyes, as it were. But here God does a great work and watches the reaction is by the neighbors and by the parents and by the religious of the time. Watch how they react. Verse 8, it says, And the neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, which when that he was blind said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? So the first thing that they want to do is figure out, Is this even the guy? I, I'm not buying this. This is a different guy. Maybe he wasn't even blind to begin with. I, I don't know what's going on. But, but that's not the same guy. He's like him. He's like, I am him. I was blind. How were thine eyes made open? Made opened? And he answered and said, I love this, a man, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go wash, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and received sight. So his focus is kind of how we get, right? He's focusing to the people and the people ask him next. Then said they unto him, where is he? And he said, I know not. His focus was on the physical reaction to the problem. Jesus simply making clay, uh, putting it on his eyes, going to wash, coming back with sight. He's also at this time referring to Jesus as a man. Like I said, it's interesting. They ask in very basic terms, and he gives a very basic answer, matter of fact testimony. And uh, if you recall back to maybe when you were first saved, I mean, I, I recall, like I said, being, being seen, like it was like scales were lifted and suddenly the whole world looked different to me. I also remember my first testimony, which was to a friend of mine, where I basically just said, you know, in the simplest of terms, well, God is real and, and I was studying the Bible and then something spoke to me from this. And, and I'm pointing to all of these tangible physical evidences that somehow I think will explain the miracle that had happened, which was a new birth. And so this man does the same thing. I'm made to see it's a great miracle, and it was because of the clay, and it was because of the pool, and it was because of the washing that I was made to see. If you go down in verse 13, after they're not really buying what's going on, says they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. So he gives a physical answer to a, a great miraculous spiritual change. He said that it was a man. He said that he washed him with clay and, and, and so on. But the people know, the neighbors know that something special had happened. Something manifested, not, not just physically, but there was a spiritual uh, uh, they would probably say it was mystical or magical or something supernatural had happened here. And so the first thing they're going to do is bring him to the religious folks. They knew aforetime that he was blind. It says in verse 13. And verse 14 gives us this important point. It says, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now, anytime we see the Sabbath, we always know there's a soft spot for the religious leaders. This was like their sacred calf was the Sabbath day. This was their, this was their golden calf that they were always bowing down to was the Sabbath that was supposed to be made for man and not man for the Sabbath. This, this was supposed to be a rest and a blessing. They had turned it into rigorous toil and suffering on the Sabbath. You have to do all of this great list of things to show how holy and sanctimonious you are. 
It's always a soft spot for these religious leaders. Verse 15, it says, Then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed and do see. Even shorter story of the same tale. Therefore said some of them, not focusing on the Savior, not focusing on even the clay or the washing, they said, This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. And isn't it so? When conversations start up of spiritual nature, there's always divisions that are caused. Some good, some bad. Fair enough. Verse 17, it says, They said unto the blind man, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? What sayest of the man, basically, that opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. So he's taken a little bit of a step here. It started off that he was a man that put clay on me. I know in my eyes I was washed. Now he says he's a prophet. And so even this unbeliever is kind of growing in his testimony of things. I don't think he's exaggerating. I think he's kind of realizing what's going on. Maybe he's hearing murmuring amongst the neighbors. And now the religious people are debating amongst each other. And some say he's a wicked person. And some say that he's got to be of God to do such miracles. And so he has come to the realization and conclusion that he is a prophet. And that's what I say of this man, Jesus. He is a prophet. So much of the world, even unbelieving world, has come to the point where they believe him as a man. They believe him as a prophet. They have gone no further than things. It's very physical, their understanding of him. He said the word. He did some things that were perceived as miracles. But ultimately, he was a man. And he was a great prophet. Verse 18 continues on we've seen the testimony and the reaction of the neighbors we've seen the reaction of the pharisees the religious at that time verse 18 it says but the jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight so they're going to go verify with the parents verse 19 and they asked them saying is this your son who ye say was born blind now it's interesting because back they had known that he was blind, verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. I believe they would have all known that, seen him begging at the uh, entrance of the um, synagogue, perhaps, or at the temple. It says, and they asked him, is this your son whom ye say was born blind? They're questioning the, the, the trueness of his birth situation. How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. So they know their boy. They know the notable miracle that has been made. But they don't regard openly who has made it, nor are they going to even verify his testimony of it. They're not going to give glory to the one that did the works and again something that you experience when you're first saved is 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 more understanding comes and as you testify he is a man and he is a prophet parents and people that are close to you quite often will not give credence to that we know that a miracle has taken place we know that josh has stopped drinking we know that josh has stopped partying we know that josh has stopped smoking there is a, a notable miracle that was done here and yet they're never going to give credence to what I have testified to them of, that a prophet, a man, hath done this notable thing unto me. Rather, they're going to say, yeah, let him speak for himself and almost wash their hands of naming the name, giving respect, giving, um, giving the proper and due praise to God who did the great work. Sometimes we get saved and we change, and, and people like our parents will blame everything else except give glory to God. And why is that? The same reason why it happened to these, and it was for fear. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Now, I've come to understand that in the day and time that they were living in, the synagogue was kind of the center of all social life. Everyone came there and, and did their did their sacrifices and did their offerings or they would come and sell and see in the shambles what they could purchase and all those sort of things were, were all revolving around the synagogue and so to be put away from your social life 
because of your son that was made to see would be a tragedy. And therefore, for fear, his parents, in verse 23, it says, therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. They didn't want to be a part of this. They didn't want to, they didn't want to give glory to God. They didn't want to even give credence to the story and testimony of their son. They acknowledged him as their own. They acknowledged that he was born blind, but it ended there. Verse 24 says, Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. What are they saying here? Give God the praise. Quit talking about Jesus. Quit talking about the man. Quit talking about the prophet. Quit talking about the spittle in the mud. Quit talking about the washing in the scent um, pool. Quit talking about all of these things and just simply give this ominous God the praise. Right? They love that term God because that can pretty much just be applied to everybody. That's why when we go to the door and we say to somebody, um, you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, too often people in, in that situation, I've seen it, it's almost, it's almost the breaking point where someone has to decide whether they're going to call upon God, which is what most will say. How do you get saved? And they're like, believe on God. I don't know how many times they hear this. Believe on God. Who's God? Oh yeah, Jesus. Right? They, 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 don't, they kind of shy away from giving Jesus the proper credit and glory in this. And even the religious here are taking Jesus out of the equation and bringing to the forefront the more palatable God. Okay? It's easier to say God. It's more comfortable to say God. Because there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can whitewash that message a little bit, clean it up by simply saying, just believe in God, just trust God, because the Muslims have God, the Jews have God, the Hindus have God, the, everything else has a God, even atheists think of themselves as God, and so that's a palatable term, but once you put the name of Jesus Christ upon that, it becomes less, less palatable. So they say, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Verse 25, he answered and said, this is one of my favorite portions of his responses to them. Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will he also be his disciples? You know, tell me the story of Jesus. Tell it again and again and again. It's almost like these guys just, they want to hear it again and again, but they don't want to hear it at the same time. It's a great answer he's given them. At this time, I believe this guy's even soul warning a little bit. He's not even saved. But he's telling them, hey, are you going to be his disciples? Are you going to fall under? I need to tell you the story again of how he healed me. Do I need, do I need to show you how I was saved from my blind state? Verse 28, then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spake unto Moses, and as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Now, they're so sure that they know that God spoke to Moses. But at the same time, they'll never acknowledge what he actually said. Go to John chapter 5, verse 46. That's made clear. John 5, verse 46. It says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So this is the straight that they're in. This is the problem that they have is that they... Acknowledge Moses as the great prophet. They acknowledge Moses as the one that spoke the words of God. As for this fellow, we don't know where he came from. We don't know whence he is. Verse 30 it says, The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now, that's a little bit of a jab because these say that they have the direct line to God, basically. They're God's chosen people as the Jews, right? God put this special anointing on him. God favors them. God blesses them above all things. Even blesses those that bless them is, is what these Jews, religious Jews, proclaim. 
And yet, claiming Moses, yet denying Moses' words, they find themselves in a problem. And here they say, for this fellow, we know not whence he is. And so what they're essentially is admitting is that while they're supposed to be the ones that are doing all of the great works for God, giving sight to the blind, uh, lightening the Gentiles, showing forth truth and good works, and being, being the example that all the world should look after, while well, they're supposed to do that, this Jesus, who you don't even know, you don't know where he came from. You don't know who he is. He was the one that did what you're supposed to be doing. He came as the light to lighten the Gentiles. And that was supposed to be your ministry, Jews. He came and gave sight to the blind, and you were supposed to illuminate the way of the Gentiles to follow after you. You're supposed to show truth and good works, and Christ came and did all of those things for you. What a marvelous thing it is that you're supposed to be the one that has helped the blind and, and given the lame ability to walk and, 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 and give great revelation of the power of God. Done so many wonderful miracles. You're supposed to be that, and yet all you can say is, as for this guy, we don't know where he came from. He wasn't from your group. He wasn't part of your religion. He wasn't part of what was expected of you. He had to come. Jesus had to send, or God had to send somebody else to do this great work. What a marvelous thing that herein, you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath done this great thing. You'd think that this great miracle healer, prophet, man would be known well of you guys. You have no clue who he is. Verse 31, he continues. And it's interesting, like I said, he started off saying, a man has anointed mine eyes with clay. This man, he is a prophet and now here he's kicking back at the religious leaders with revelations from God that almost seem to be spirit led. How, how can a man that was only made to see just a few moments ago now able to give such great insights into the power and, and truths of God? Verse 31 it says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Direct revelation from John chapter 5 and verse 19. John 5 and verse 19. <clears throat> then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. And it's wonderful, back in John chapter 9, because we see that's exactly what had happened. Jesus, following the Father of himself doing nothing, made the religious zealots to marvel. These were left marveling while the blind man, is completely ignorant before this of any spiritual truth, sees and testifies of the Savior that they should have known about if they had believed Moses. And yet here he is. Like I said, we've got to look at these kinds of things because we don't meditate or have prepared or, or wonder about or, or, or go before having a great illustration, a great example, a great sermon prepared to speak the truth unto the religious people that call us to their synagogues, call us to before kings, call us to different opportunities of testimony. But we see here, the great power was given unto a man of whom it would be least expected that he would be able to see and then testify of the Savior that the religious had no clue about. He reveals here in this statement that Jesus is not a sinner. He reveals in this statement that Jesus is a follower of God. He reveals in this statement that Jesus does the will of God and shows great miracles. So he's come from, he's just a man that put clay on me. To, this man is a great prophet. So now he's saying he's not a sinner. He's a follower of God. He does the will of the Father. He shows forth great miracles that no man has ever seen. And if his, this man was not for, of God... He could do none of these things. He's verifying Jesus even in his ignorance. I love this. Even, even as he didn't even prepare for these things. He didn't know these things before they came out of his mouth. 
Now, the Jews require a sign, and here, that blind beggar is the very sign that they're blind to see. And then, not only is it a sign that they can see and behold, a man that, that was born blind can now see, and of course, they're in denial of the trueness of the, of the, of the event, of the miracle. Here, that blind beggar is that sign, and that blind beggar even continues as the sign to explain himself. Verse 34, they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and thus thou teach us? And they cast him out. The Bible says that Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not, but rather thrust him out. And even so, the blind goes to the religious groups as a sign, and as an explanation of a sign, a testimony of Jesus Christ, and was received not, but was rather thrust out. We ought not be surprised when the same thing happens to us. Verse 35 says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And so this blind man went on this journey where he was made to see. A great physical miracle happened. And it wasn't because of the physical thing that, he, that Jesus did. Rather, I believe the same way as anything, it was the faith that the man exhibited when he went and washed in that pool. And so by faith he received the healing. And then as he walked before men and had to have his testimony challenged and have his beliefs challenged and have his, 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 his understanding of the situation challenged, he learned that Jesus was a man, yes. He was also a prophet, yes. He was also, he was also a great um, leader. He was also not a sinner. He was a follower of God. He was doing his will. He was showing great miracles. And as he receives all of this, it comes to the point where his ignorant insights had him thrown out by the religious. And it's wonderful because that's the exact moment that Jesus comes to him. He heard that religious people wanted nothing to do with him. He heard that he was rejected by neighbors. He heard that he was essentially denied by parents. His testimony was. And that's when Jesus finds him. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Like it got to the point where he literally had no one else to rely on. Because of the healing that you would think people would rejoice over, because of the change in this man you thought people would get excited about, he came face to face with Jesus, and Jesus healed him of his blindness. And you would think people would be excited, but instead, he gets rejected by the neighbors. He's rejected by his parents. He's rejected by the religious, and that's where Jesus finds him. And he has nothing at this point. He's got nothing to trust in, no one to trust in. You believe on the Son of God? Who is he that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, verse 37, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. The blind here was given sight, and the blind was given salvation. Verse 38, and he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Another great example of our Lord Jesus receiving worship. Now this blind, old, uneducated nobody, he sees. And we as often blind about future situations, uneducated, nobodies in this world, will see. And in these last days, we will testify. In these last days, we will show truths and revelation that are unheard of. And don't expect anything else but your neighbors to reject it. Your parents to be confused and to, by and large, Reject it, thrust you away. Don't, don't be surprised when you're thrown out by neighbors and the religious. The religious, because they don't get it, because it's not someone that they know of their stock, because things aren't done in their own traditional way, they will by and large reject the testimony that comes in these last days from true believers of Christ. But that doesn't mean we will we'll, we'll balk at the opportunity to give it. 
Now, just because they rejected, just because as Jeremiah did of old, he went through he went through preaching and preaching and preaching and saw very few salvations, but his message went to the entire world. I believe that would be our opportunity in these last days. We'll be given great, great opportunities to proclaim the word of God in our own minute understanding of it. God will find us there. He'll help us. Now us, we can be that once blind nobody showing people the salvation and our Savior. If you continue down in verse 39, it says, And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see! Therefore your sin remaineth. God here highlights the fact that he came into this world for judgment. He came into this world because that's what he desires, is that judgment would be fulfilled. Judgment on sins, judgment on death, judgment on on all of the wickedness in order that he could set things right and, and start over his kingdom afresh. Unfortunately, though, in these last days, I believe he needs us to dish it out. He needs his works to be manifest, and he's going to choose, you know, blind, uneducated, ignorant dummies to do it, just like he did in this example. He took judgment to the very throne of the synagogue of Satan, the truth was proclaimed about the Savior, about the healing, about the miracles that he had done. His work was manifested to them. They rejected it. This man received of the, of the, the miracle by faith when in verse 7 it says, He was sent to wash and he went according to the word and came seeing. And us too, we don't have everything figured out. We're blind in a lot of things, and yet still I believe God wants us here for judgment in this world, and he is going to use us to dish it out. That those that are blind should see, and those that see should be made blind. The Pharisees asked, are we blind also? He said, if you were blind, you should have no sin. In other words, in other words if you can understand the fact that you are not you know, perfect in your understanding, you're blind. You're not believing. You're not trusting by faith. If you could understand that you're blind, you would have no sin in this scenario. You'd have no sin in this instance because, because at least you know that there's something you don't understand. But now, as the religious leaders of this world, you are claiming, I see, and therefore your sin remaineth on you. You've got to admit that you're blind before you can get healed and see. That's what he's saying here. They're walking around saying, we see, we see, we see. Therefore, God can't heal them. And therefore, when judgment comes, when Christ enters into their midst and does a great and notable miracle among them, they reject it. That's what we're going to see in these last days, the proclaiming of the truth and great and notable miracles upon God's people. I'll go to Hebrews chapter 11. It's my last stop. Hebrews chapter 11. God wants judgment in this world. We're going to be used to dish it out. I was talking the other day about, about Jeremiah, and by and large, he had a negative message, and yet he took that message, and there's a list in the pages of that book where it, it just lists off nations that he'd been to. And it is, it is the, the whole known world at that time that Jeremiah took that message. It's two-thirds negative to the people, and saw very little people repent and get right with God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet. And when we read the scriptures, are we not being warned of things that aren't seen yet? Warned of things to come? Warned of things which shall be hereafter? It talks about in Revelation. There, there are things on the horizon that we are being warned of. We don't see them yet. That means we're blind to those things. We can't understand every aspect of all the things that are going on. And yet we've been warned of God of these same things which are not seen. What did he do? He moved with fear. So he was given insight to the things that are coming, though he was blind. And then, 
By fear, he moved. And what did he do? Exactly what God said he should do. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. The Bible says, if we believe, thou shalt be saved and thy house. Okay? And so Noah couldn't understand these things that were afar off. But he knew that God had told him to do something. Even so, we're blind. And God puts a little dirt on our faces, makes things challenging for us, but then tells us to do something. Go and wash thy face. Noah here moved with fear and washed his face, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, okay, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith, even as our blind beggar received sight by faith, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, and by doing that act by faith and receiving the miracle of God, went about, and fortunately for him and unfortunately for those, he condemned the world by the testimony that he had. Why? Because they rejected it and rejected it and rejected it and rejected it. And I believe this is going to be the calling of us in the last days. We're given sight by the word. By faith we receive what God says and is clear and understandable, you know, fellowshipping, congregating as a church, you know, going into the world and preaching the gospel, loving your neighbor as yourself, all of these commands that God gives to us very clearly. But we don't have everything figured out. There's things that aren't seen yet. There's things that we've been warned of, but we don't understand how they're all going to play out. We're still blind in that area. But if we act by faith, and prepare the ark. If we act by faith and testify of the Savior, if we act by faith and do what he says, the Bible teaches here that our actions will be that which condemns the world. It says it became heirs of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith we receive righteousness. We become heirs of that. We're already there by believing and trusting and having the faith to do that. There's heirs of we can be heirs of righteousness beyond that, I even believe. By faith. Faith is always going to be that, that action that we do. We put faith in God, and he's going to do great exploits to us. And I believe, the Bible is teaching us here in an example, that even somebody that was blind, was given sight, can have a great impact on hordes of people just by proclaiming God's word. And his minute understanding of it, that grows and grows and grows and grows to the end that he condemns. Unfortunately, those that reject the word by and large. There's probably people, though, that heard and received and saw the miracle and were saved as a result of it. But God's giving us here an example of a blind that's trying to show people the light of the Savior. Yeah, he did some physical things in this world, but ultimately it was the faith that activated this man to be that great and strong testimony in John chapter 9. And I believe we have the same scenario. There's things we can do in order to help and appease our scenario and our situation. You know, we can put some mud on things. We can put some mud on our eyes and on the house. We can do some, some preparations in the physical realm. But ultimately, when God says go and wash, go and wash. And when you go and wash, you know what that is to the end of? That you would come out and condemn the world. That's what, by and large, our testimony is going to be in these last days. We're going to have great opportunities to see lots of people say, but what was our percentage yesterday? Like... One salvation, one gospel, and then like 20 people that were just like, yeah, that's the end, right? So that, that's, that's the result. There's going to be hardened hearts over what's going on right now, but there's also going to be people that are ready to hear. So let's go and be that testimony in our mind and our saying, let the Spirit of God work in us. Let's go and by faith do exactly what God plans and commands us to do, condemning the world and becoming an heir of righteousness as a result. And he'll get all the glory. And all of these things. Jesus Christ, not just God, right? Yeah. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, Father. I thank you.